Yeah? Okay. Good. Uh, does everybody remember the cloud? Yes? So we, we will not do the cloud today? Or is anybody particularly interested in going through the cloud today? You can vote. Who wants to go through the cloud? Okay, who, who wants to skip the cloud? Okay, so this is for today, yes, for today, of course. So this is uh, one against four. <laughs> and the rest of you <laughs> um, seems to be undecided. Let's say it this way, undecided. Good, so then uh, there was uh, almost a clear majority towards not doing the cloud, so we will skip the cloud today. And uh, to be honest, we only have one lecture in this week. And on Thursday, there's a national holiday, right? So we will skip next week's lecture. And then next week, on Tuesday, we can go through the cloud again, because then we have already... Does the, the Bergkirchweih, the beer festival, already start next week? No, it's, no, it's uh, on Thursday, right? N next week, Thursday. So probably also a hard time. Oh, no, well, the lecture is at 12 on Thursday. Maybe you can go to the lecture and then to the beer festival. That could be like the awesome preparation for going to the beer festival lecture and then um, try to get one of the free beers. Huh? Sounds like a brilliant plan. Okay, good. Then uh, let's not do the cloud today and we will talk again about pre-processing and image enhancement. And we've already seen um, the motivation and we already talked a bit about uh, the normalized convolution. So let's, for, uh, let's skip over this motivation. So you've seen the nice colorful images, and yeah, uh, colorful images are nice, and in medical, it, there's typically a lot of information also in the red channel, and uh, you can go ahead and then process the data in order to improve the image quality and reduce the noise. So you've seen this, and let's, let's have a look again at this awesome video. Yeah? So you see there's some outliers in the center. This is invalid measurement, and there it seems that the object is super close to the camera, but that's of course not true. And now we remove the outliers. We essentially use the normalized convolution that we'll go through quickly after this video. Then we use some temporal smoothing because we have a lot of frames per second, and this way we can reduce the noise further. And now we can then try to incorporate edge-preserving filtering. And if you do edge-preserving filtering, you can get a result like this one. And you see that this is much better than the raw input data that you've just seen. So we can do a lot with some rather simple tricks in order to improve image quality. So this is one of the, one of the messages you should take home from this lecture is that you can actually improve the raw input data considerably with some nice uh, filtering tricks. Okay, good. So we already talked about a normalized convolution. Let's go back to, to the definitions and uh, how we actually want to describe those convolution kernels. And what we will start with is, like in the last lecture, the uh, traditional uh, spatial domain variant of the convolution. So we have n pixels. n is the number of total pixels in the image. And we will also use it later to uh, discuss complexity of the algorithms because we will see some of those algorithms are really fast. Okay, so the input image uh, is 2D, but the total number, um, so if you have a continuous um, uh, index for the pixels, it's going to be n. Uh, these pixels are uh, discrete and they are in a vector where you have the x and y coordinate. And you have some local neighborhood that you define uh, with, an odd, uh, with an odd number in x and y direction where you define r as the radius and then 2 times r plus 1 squared will give you the total number of elements in this neighborhood. So we always have a center pixel in the convolution kernel. Then we consider g as the input image and f as the output image. Now, if you go to discrete convolution, and this is just a, a refresher, of course, you have some kind of kernel. And here, the kernel is denoted as uh, k. And k is going to be, for example, the Gaussian kernel. So here, you see the example for the Gaussian kernel. And you essentially weigh the distance to the center pixel. And you have some standard deviation. And if, you, um, if your kernel is big enough, you can just truncate it to zero. 
So you define your kernel size, sample your Gaussian in here, and this, is, this will be the kernel that you use for convolution. And of course, in this case, the convolution theorem holds. So instead of computing this in spatial domain and doing all the multiplications and sums, you can just transfer your kernel and your image to, uh, to the frequency domain and then just multiply the two and transfer back. So this would be the quick implementation uh, using, uh, uh, using convolution theory. Okay, good. Then you can also uh, formalize this uh, as a normalized convolution and the trick in normalized convolution is now that you introduce a membership function and you assign the value one if you have a valid pixel and zero if you have an invalid pixel. And this is the, what we did in the beginning. So we were canceling out the invalid measurements and this way we create an adaptive kernel for every picture element. For every pixel we have a different kernel and if there is a pixel in the neighborhood that is invalid, it will automatically be masked with zero. And we mask it uh, with zero in the kernel, but as well uh, in the uh, part where we compute the convolution. Yeah? So if we kick it out from the kernel, we will also kick it out um, in the sum over the kernel that is not weighted with the image. In this way, you automatically scale the output of your convolution to be always the same. And this is very efficient to remove outliers from your data. So if you just have single elements missing, this is a very efficient technique to remove those outliers. And um, the content of the convolution, the result of the convolution, will be driven only by the valid pixels. But remember, in this case, you end up with a convolution that will be the convolution kernel will be spatially varying. So the convolution theorem no longer holds for this implementation, but it's a very nice and efficient way to deal with invalid pixels uh, as long as you have small kernels. Small kernels, and of course, this kind of method you can parallelize very efficiently because you can uh, run every kernel execution in a parallel thread, and you can parallelize over the number of pixels in your image. So if you have whatever, uh, uh, a megapixel, yeah, you have a million pixels, then you can also run a million threads on a, a respective graphics card and run this very, very quickly. Okay, good. But of course, uh, you have limits to the kernel execution. So if the kernel takes too long, and this would be the case if you have two large kernels, then uh, you have to think of other ideas how to do the parallelization. Okay, good. Uh, for example, one way you could do it uh, would be um, cascading. So you cascade several versions of the, uh, of the convolution. If you have a Gaussian, you can cascade it and you can just convolve mult multiple times with smaller Gaussians and they will uh, sum up to a convolution with a larger Gaussian. So you've already seen that. Good. So this would be one way to do it. Normalized convolution. In normalized convolution, we already introduced this concept that we have a different convolution kernel at every picture element. And now in bilateral filtering, we expand this concept a little more. Now bilateral filtering will now also consider edge information in the image. So you will see here in, in the equation in the center, if you compare this equation with this equation up here, you see that the kernel uh, was now decomposed into uh, this membership function, C, and A was essentially the old, old Gaussian kernel. Yeah? So we decomposed K into two factors. And this is just a normal Gaussian kernel, and this was this uh, idea of, um, of a membership function that we, we can use to kick out certain elements that we didn't want. Now, of course, we can also do more tricks like that. And that extension is essentially the bilateral filter. And in the bilateral filter, we want to preserve edges while smooth only of in, within areas of the same intensity. So the idea is that instead of putting in a zero, one membership functions, as we did for the invalid pixels, we will plug something in which will not only be, so the Gaussian kernel has this nice property that it, uh, it encodes a spatial neighborhood. So the farther away you're from the center, the less contribution you get to the convolution result. 
And now the idea is we can also do something similar, but not in spatial domain, but in intensity domain. So we can include something that tells us if the pixel in the neighborhood has a similar intensity, then we just smooth. And if it has a very different intensity, we will reduce the weight of the kernel. And if this way, we can design custom kernels for every pixel. And the idea is that if we have a, start, a, a large difference in intensity, this large difference in intensity will correspond to an edge. OK. So what do we do? We follow the same idea. So we have the spatial closeness that is now here called C. And this is nothing else than our Gaussian kernel that we had previously. And now we include another term, which is called S. And S is called range similarity. We call it range similarity here because we operate on range images. So this is the, the difference in intensity or in the, in the depth images. Intensity will be equivalent to distance. Uh, so we have a range similarity. And this range similarity is essentially not the position of the pixel. So we always have the pixel in the center and the, uh, and the moving pixel in the convolution mask. And here we replace the two just um, with a one-dimensional Gaussian. And here we subtract the two intensities. So we don't take the position, but the intensities. And of course, similar to the Gaussian kernel here, where we had the geometric closeness, we can also introduce a standard deviation for the range similarity. And here we can define, essentially, the step, the edge size that we will still allow. So if you have large edges, we don't want to smooth over them. And, but if you have very small edges, they could be noise. And the small edges, we want to smooth away. And we encode that in this range, uh, in this, uh, range sigma. OK, here is um, a visualization of the working principle. These are the two kernels. So on the left-hand side, you see the image. This is the input data. The input data is g of x. And the output data is f of the bilateral filter. So this is our filter result. And now if you pick, this is one instance of the kernel. And what this kernel does, and this is, of course, an instance that is here. You see, right after the edge, or on this side. And here, you can see that we have a lot of influence on the upper side. Yeah, the upper side of the edge, we have a lot of influence. But from the lower side of the edge, we have almost no influence. And this is, of course, because of this S term. Okay? So we can also think about this in 1D. So this is a very simple consideration. So let's say we have um, this kind of edge. And now I pick a position that is maybe at this point, then you will realize, so what we actually want to do is we want to compute something similar to a Gaussian kernel. And the Gaussian kernel would, of course, look like this, right? OK, slightly more to the left. So I, I will move my, my edge here a little. OK, so this is, the, this is the pixel under consideration. And the peak of the Gaussian is, of course, in the center uh, of this pixel. And now what we are doing is we are, this, this would be just the C part. Yeah? So this would be C of x, x prime. And what we see here is g of x. And now we can compute c times s, c times s. And c times s will then, um, because there is little difference between the intensities on the left-hand side, you will have a high value and you will have a low value on this side. So c times s will look on this side. It will look exactly, so this is where our edge is coming in. On this side, it will look exactly like the Gaussian. So actually, it needs to look like this. So we are already going slightly downward here. But on the right-hand side, there is a high difference. And the high difference in the Gaussian will cause it to be very close to 0. So what will happen on this side is uh, it will essentially look like this. Yeah? 
So you will have a down-weighted version here. And of course, if you do the same trick on this side, so let's, uh, let's go to, to an observation here. Yeah, then your edge is still here. And here you will ob obviously just get the opposite kernel. So you will get a kernel that will probably look like this. So if your pixel of reference is at this point, you will smooth on this side only. And if the pixel of reference is on this side, you will smooth only on this side. And that is a very powerful concept. And it's, it's really easy to follow, right? We don't need a lot of the, well, we, of course, we can look at the formula. But this concept is very simple to understand. And this is also a reason why this bilateral filter is really, really popular. A lot of people have been using this. And you can also easily extend it. You can uh, implement uh, also different stopping criterion in the kernel and then further extend it. And people have been playing with this a lot. Or you could also use, instead of Gaussians, you could also use other low-pass filters. So there's plenty of ways of doing this. So very popular, very useful concept. And as long as you have small kernels, you can use the same trick as in the normalized convolution. Yeah. So you, you, sorry, you compute the kernel on the fly, and you parallelize everything. And the small kernels, you can do that very, very quickly. Yeah. Question? Yeah. How to compute the kernel? This is in the previous slide. So the kernel is computed as the multiplication of C and S. And C is just the Gaussian. And you multiply with, um, with a Gaussian that is defined in intensity domain. So this is G of x minus G of x prime. So maybe it helps if we draw. So if we additionally also put in the S, S will simply look like, like this. And in this case, S will look like this. And if the pixel of reference is on the other side, it will look exactly the opposite. So you have, because it's defined on the intensity range, it will uh, measure the similarity between intensities. So these intensities are all very similar. And these intensities are very similar. And once you cross the border, once you cross the edge, they're very dissimilar. So this is just a mul multiplication of this guy with the Gaussian. Are there more questions? Yes? Is there any advantage um, about using the Gaussian instead of, for example, using a Perona Malik? Well, with, with Perona Malik, you, you, you end up with a diffusion system, right? So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, so this is actually true. There, uh, there are conditions under which uh, the bilateral filter is just one iteration step of the Peruna Malik. So they're, 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 this is like one of the update steps that you do in the when you solve the the PDE. Yeah. So there's this is this. It's also nice because you can find mathematical uh, similarities uh, between. Uh, a diffusion uh, kind of filtering, yes. So there's also people that actually uh, use the bilateral filtering then in optimization problems. And you can also show that there are conditions under which you can uh, use one iteration of the bilateral filter instead of um, a regularization step, for example, with total variation minimization and so on. So you can even, even show that uh, they end up with uh, very similar ma uh, mathematical properties. And then you can also put it into, into an iteration scheme where you solve the data uh, similarity, and then you use the bilateral filter to enforce like the stepwise, uh, uh, stepwise constants, uh, constancy. OK. Yeah, so this is, it's, it's a simple concept. You can understand it very quickly, but you can also go into the math and realize that it's also a very powerful concept that you can actually derive uh, from a sophisticated, more sophisticated procedure. Good. So it's very nice. It's edge-preserving denoising. So that's a very nice property. Then uh, there is a very nice relation to normalized convolution. So we can immediately understand it as an extension of normalized convolution. 
But uh, as uh, in the normalized convolution, uh, this um, similarity term is not shift invariant. So as soon as you move across your image, you will get a different filtering kernel. And the complexity is n times r square. Because your uh, kernel is square in r, and uh, the number of pixels is linear in n. So complexity is n times r square for computing this. So if you end up with large kernels, your complexity will dramatically increase. So this will end up to be quite inefficient if you do large kernels. Yeah, and of course, um, closeness and similarity are not restricted to the Gaussian case. You can also uh, use other, uh, other functions to design your filter. Good. So bilateral filtering, very useful. One thing with the bilateral filter is it's efficient for small kernels. But what happens if you want to really use larger kernels, larger areas? And this is the place where the guided filtering comes in. So guided filtering has been proposed in 2010, the European Conference on Computer Vision. And it has also been widely exploited because the concept is also very rather easy, easy to follow. We will also shortly derive it. And the nice thing with the guided filtering is we will boil down everything to box filters. And we've already hinted on that in the previous lecture that box filters can be implemented very efficiently. efficiently. And this way, you can implement the guided filter in a complexity of O of n. And O of M is really cool because then we can also do really large kernels um, at the same cost. So this is a very useful concept. Now, the idea of guided filtering is derived by introducing another image. So previously, we had a G as the input image and F as the output image. And now we introduce a third image. And the third image is uh, the guidance image. So we will call it I and the following. So this is a dedicated image which contains, let's say, optimal information to control the, uh, the guidance process. So one example, could be, for exa uh, one example could be that you have an image that has been taken with a lot of light. So a very, a very famous example is uh, flash and no flash pairs. This is then also later when we show the joint bilateral filtering. It's a very similar idea where you see edges very well. So you take one image where you see edges really well, and you say, take a second image that, for example, um, that, for example, preserves the color properties that you want to have. So if you take an image without flash, you will get nice colors, so you can preserve the color information because it's not influenced by the flashlight. The flashlight will alter the colors in the scene. But you have much less information because you will get a lot of noise. You get much fewer photons because the illumination is bad. So you, you get much more noise. And now the idea, for example, could be you take the image that has a lot of photons, has very uh, good noise properties, you extract the edges, and then you control the denoising process in the image, which is very noisy and where the edges are really difficult to see. So you want to preserve the edges from the guidance image in the observed image. That's the idea. And we will actually see that this is also super useful for medical imaging later. For example, if you have photon counting detectors. So towards the end of this lecture, we will introduce something that's called the joint bilateral filtering. And it's using a very similar concept for preserving intensities in specific energy channels while controlling the denoising process with the information that has the best signal-to-noise ratio. Good. So we will take this guidance image, and at the moment we don't care very much where it's actually coming from, but there is occasions where you can derive such a guidance image that is really useful. What we then want to do is we want to say the output image should be a linear combination of the guidance image and uh, just some scaling A and some offset B. So we want to get the filter result as a scaled version of the guidance image. This is very useful. For example, if you would take the gradient that we introduced by this model, you will see that the gradient 
in the output image will be dominated by the by the guidance image. Yeah? So it will be a scaled version of the guided image. So this is nice, and this is what we wanted to have, right? We want to preserve the edges from the uh, from the guidance image in the output image. Good. If we do that, we can set up a cost function, and in this cost function, it's a simple least squares cost function, and all that we say is we want to determine the coefficients ax and bx. These are the two coefficients that I need to control the guidance image, and I want to derive those coefficients such that in a local neighborhood, so we're only operating in the local neighborhood here, in the local neighborhood around our pixel x, we want to take, this is f ax i plus bx. This is nothing else but f. So we say that the output of our filter should be close to the input. g is the input, f is the output, and we want to determine a and b such that they optimally reflect the input that is given by the current image, and we just put it into a square which will punish everything that is further away from the inputs. Then we add a little regularization, and the regularization here um, will be epsilon. Epsilon is, a, is um, a constant that we introduce. It's a parameter to control the regularization. And the penalty that we want to have, we want to have a squared to be small. So we want to punish high values of a. So if A gets too high, it should also receive a penalty. That's the other point. Yeah? So we don't want to overemphasize the gradient in the input image. That's the penalty that we want to introduce. So we can understand this cost function. This is just the output minus the input to the power of 2 plus the regularization parameter where we punish too high gradients. So this is the output, this is the input, and this is the regularization. Good. Now we can go ahead and take this cost function and we compute partial derivatives with respect to Ax. And if you take the partial derivative with respect to Ax here, you have to see that uh, this is to the power of 2. And then you still have to multiply with i because the only term in here that is dependent on Ax is axi, so you still have to multiply with this, and then you get rid of the power of 2, and here you also get rid of the power of 2, and because you postulate, so because you want to find the extremum of this function, you set it to 0, and then you get rid of the 2s, yeah? so you can just divide by 2, so they will be gone. Good. If you do that, you can rearrange this a little, and what we are doing first is we see that this summation, the summation, oh, sorry, this is the, sorry. This is the partial derivative with respect to bx, and if we compute the partial derivative with respect to bx, we will see that uh, this term is only dependent on bx at this point, and we will get uh, only uh, axi plus bx minus g and the sum over these terms as partial derivative in bx. Now we can do something nice because we can rearrange this a little. You will realize that we can break up the sum. So this is only additions. So we can take this uh, sum and break it into three sums. And the three sums um, will be a sum over axi, a sum over bx, and a sum over gx prime. Now in the sum over axi, you will realize that axi is independent of x prime, so we can pull it out. So here you get a sum over, over ix prime. So this is just a sum over ix prime. Then here you will realize that you can also take out bx, and this is just a sum over 1. And here you will realize that this, the remaining function here is just a sum over gx prime of a gx prime. This is nice because the sum over 1 is just the number of elements that you have in your kernel. You can, you can take the number, so the sum over, over elements of 1 will just equal to the number of elements in this kernel. 
So we can uh, replace this here just with the number of elements. And the next thing that we can, so, uh, that we can do is we can actually um, rearrange this to, so this is still the same equation just with the replacement done here. It's ax times the sum over i plus bx times the number of elements uh, minus the sum over gx prime in the neighborhood. Now you can rearrange this a bit. So you can take the bx and move it to the other side. So I'm just um, subtracting bx here and I'm multiplying with minus one. So this entire term goes to the other side and I'm multiplying with minus one. This is why the signs flip. And I'm dividing by the number of elements in the kernel. Okay, so we're just moving this to the other side. So we're solving for bx and then divide by the number of elements. And what falls out of here is a sum over gx prime divided by the number of elements minus ax times a sum over yx prime divided by the number of elements. Does this somehow seem familiar? Yes? Yes, it's simply a mean value or a box filter. So we simply have mean values here. So these are box filters. So I can express the computation for bx in terms of a mean value of the input image and the mean value of the ideal image. And they are only associated by ax. And we already learned that mean filters we can compute very efficiently. So now we can go ahead and also replace the mean values with expected values. So I'm just changing the notation into a probabilistic framework and a probabilistic notation. And this way, we just get bx equals to the expected value of g of x minus ax times the expected value of i of x. So it's only expected values. Good, so this way we found a solution for bx. And now we can also take a look at the partial derivative um, with respect to ax. And here you will realize that we can replace bx. So we can replace bx with the solution that we found previously. So we have this combination of expected values. And now we can rearrange. And what you'll find in the rearranging is that we are able to break up our sums again. And what we do find is that we can rearrange this as a sum over i, um, i x prime times i x prime minus the expected value of i x. And we can also find uh, g x prime times i x prime minus the expected value of g x. And this is then multiplied still with i x. And you can actually uh, divide by the number of elements here. So the number of elements comes, uh, uh, comes out again and solve for a x. And what you now realize, if you rearrange this, you only, get, you only get mean and box filters here. But the other interesting part is that you get an expected value of I, I x times I x minus an expected value of I x times um, the expected value of I x. And you can rearrange this actually. Oh, sorry. So you, can, you get the expected value here minus the expected value of ix times the expected value of ix. And on the other side, you get the expected value of gx times ix minus the expected value of g times the expected value of i. And if you look this up, actually, this boils down to nothing else than variances and covariances. So a variance you can also express of e, the expected value of x square, minus the expected value of x square. And the covariance you can express as e time, uh, as the expected value of x times y, minus the expected value of x times the expected value of y. And this is exactly the case up here. So you can boil this down and obtain ax as the covariance of gx, ix, 
divided by the variance of Ix plus the regularization parameter. So we find a nice closed form solution for Ax here. And we have a closed form solution for Bx, we have a closed form solution uh, of Ax, and now we can actually put this in. So this is already nice. So we can find Ax and Bx very efficiently, and essentially this just builds on box filters. So we can only use box filters to determine this. So we get rid of the entire size of the box filter because we know we can use integral images. And now we can consider a special case. And the special case would be that the input image and the guidance image is identical. So let's consider this special case. And what will happen is the covariance will boil down to a variance. So it's a variance of g of x divided by the variance of g of x plus e. And our bx will only be the expected value of the input image minus ax times the expected value of the input image. This is a very strange formulation, but we can think about it a little. So let's say uh, our regularization is zero. And now consider an area where we have a flat patch. And in a flat patch area, you will realize that you have a zero variance. If you have a zero variance, your Ax will be zero. Now you have zero variance, so this part on the right-hand side of Bx will cancel out. And the only part that remains is the expected value of Gx. So in a flat area, this filter will compute a box filter. In an area that has no variance, where all the intensities are similar, you will compute a smoothing. And if you have a high variance, and that is typically the case if you have edges. If you, edge, if you have edges, you will end up in a patch that has high variance. And in the high variance case, you will say, if you will have a high, num, uh, high value for the variance and you divide by the variance, so you will get one for Ax. And if Ax equals to one, if you look at Bx, you will realize that you have the expected value minus the expected value. So it will cancel out to zero. So in this case, you have bx zero and ax one. Now, we, if, we, if we plug that in our, um, in our original formulation, just remember that our filter, our filter output in this case will be ax times g of x minus, uh, so minus b sorry, plus bx, right? This is our filter output. And now if you have the flat patch case, ax equals to zero, so this part will cancel out, and you only have the box filter remain. So in the flat patch, the filter output will be the output of a mean filter. And in the case where you have high variance, bx will be zero, and ax will be one, so there will be no filtering done at all. So this very nicely combines in areas of high variance, edges, you get no filtering, and in areas where you have small variance, you will get uh, smoothing. So this is uh, edge preservation. This is, this is what we wanted to have. So we want to have preserve the gradients. Good. So we have this edge preservation property here, and we can also use a guidance image. So this is this derivation of the guided filter is, is a very nice trick. Yeah? And we can very nicely follow it, and you have everything on the slides. And I can tell you that the guided filter is something that we typically look at in quite some detail. So if you are preparing for the exam, it would be a useful thing to go through this set of slides, and you have the entire derivation here, yeah? just as a hint. So the criterion of flat patch and a high variance uh, can be further controlled by epsilon. Good. One thing that we neglected so far is, of course, we had only one local window. What you typically want to do is you would to compute those coefficients for your entire image. And then what you're doing is you will have a rather noisy impression of your coefficients because they will change very quickly from one neighborhood to, the, to another. So what you do in addition, you would put a filter on your, you put a filter 
on your local window results, and then you smooth over, uh, over coefficients here. Yeah? So you actually not just apply a single coefficient per, per pixel, but you're actually using the coefficients in the neighborhood to compute the actual filter result. So you apply a, an additional averaging over the local coefficients of um, AX and BX. This helps you to reduce um, uh, to getting a very unstable, noisy result. And the very cool thing is it can be expressed with mean filters only. And the mean filters we can compute very, very efficiently. So this is, this is the backbone, and we already talked about this. We can build integral images where we sum up everything that is left and top of the current pixel position. So this is an integral image, and in this integral image, you sum up all of the original image values that are smaller with respect to x and smaller with respect to y. It contains the sum over here. If we do so, we can then express our mean filter result by just using four values. So we just take those four values and you get the mean filter result. And of course, we only have um, four additions and this has a complexity of one. So for every pixel, we only have a fixed number of additions that we use to compute the kernel output independent of the kernel size if we are using integral images. So here's an example for integral images. And let's say you want to compute the area of these uh, of this uh, part of this patch, you want to compute the mean. What you do is, you well, you can just compute the mean. Yeah, you can just take the nine values here, and you will get the result here. So this would be the mean. But on the other hand, you can just you see, you take the uh, element top left, and the element in the bottom right. You take those two. This will give you the area in the original image of this patch, and this will give you the area, area of the original image in the entire big patch here. Yeah? So this is 442, and this is uh, 56. And now what you do is you also take those two areas. So you take the big area, then you subtract the entire area here, and then you subtract the entire area here, and you realize that you have subtracted this area twice, so you add it back. So you add this value plus this value and subtract this value and this value. And if you do that, you also end up with 154. Just four summations, four additions, and you're done. So complexity one. Awesome. So now you can do that and implement it also in the graphics card to even uh, speed it up further and there's some, um, some challenges in this. So first of all, you want to be able yeah, you want to be able to implement this very, very quickly. And typically, what you want to do is you want to do all your imaging in real time. In an interventional environment, you want to do it in real time. And probably the cheapest solution to implement something very quickly is buying a graphics card. And there's even dedicated graphics cards that don't have a graphic output anymore. So they are only used for computing. So you can buy them, put it into your machine, you put in four different um, Tesla cards. Are they still called Tesla? I think so. So these are the dedicated computing devices. They, they don't even have a graphics output. So you put your data on the graphics card, crunch it. It has uh, thousands of processors nowadays, thousands of parallel processors on one graphics card. And then you do the crunching. So you can easily parallelize over the, uh, you can easily parallelize over the pixels and then you get your result. You copy it back from the graphics card and then you can display it. So if you really do it for display, it's even better because the output is already on the graphics card. So you take the data that you want to display, copy it to the graphics card, do the computations, and then you even don't have to copy it back because it's already located in the graphics card and you can display it. And for these reasons, 
sometimes they also had very cheap memory in the graphics card. So in, in the older graphics cards, they had um, memory that would be not, very, not accurate and would have pixel errors. So sometimes this memory would have cells that do not accurately compute. But it doesn't matter if you have a single pixel error, but you are computing at frame rates 30 frames per second or even higher, this sing single pixel error won't matter. So if you have a problem with the memory, it will be discarded in the next screen. Now with the uh, more pricey graphics cards, you get for sure some memory that will be available for computation and there you also get accurate memory cells. And I think nowadays um, all of these uh, graphics cards already have better kinds of memory. But in the old graphics cards, you sometimes had trouble with the computation and the memory because it was not that accurate. And you could buy a more expensive graphics card that would have a more reliable memory. But nowadays, it's not, no longer such a problem. The other thing that you do on graphics cards is you can actually choose the precision of your computations. So something which is also very popular if you don't need this high accuracy because you just need it to display stuff. What you can do is you can reduce from 32-bit or from 64-bit precision, you can go down to 16-bit and just do floating point operations in 16 bits and then just display stuff and with the computation of the next frame it will be replaced. And if you have only half precision, then you will, can do the computations much quicker. And another thing that is super nice about graphics cards is that they have hardware accelerated interpolation. So when we do interpolation, we do a weighted sum of two elements. You have element one plus element two, uh, and element one times A plus element two times B, and this is just a single operation on the graphics card. So instead of two multiplications and one addition, it's just a single operation. And of course, this scales also to higher dimensions. So with new graphics cards, newer graphics cards have 3D interpolation. So you do a trilinear interpolation in a 3D image. Let's say you have a volumetric image. Then you do the interpolation in, it will do it in hardware, so it's just a single clock cycle to do the interpolation. And with this trick, you can also speed up computation dramatically. This has two advantages. First of all, the interpolation is just a single, so for example, one thing that you can do very efficiently is a sum. If you want to compute a sum over a total image, Let's say it's a 2D, 2D image, and uh, we have a very simple case, so we will not have too many threads. What I can do is, with this interpolation, I can automatically interpolate arbitrary points in the grid. And for creating a sum, what I could do, for example, is access this grid point. Because th if this is element 2, 3, 4, 5, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, five, six, seven, eight. Now all you do is, you say I want this point here. And what it will do is, it will create a interpolation here and it will compute one over four times one, one plus two plus three plus four. And this will be the result of the interpolation. And now you want to compute the same thing. Uh, okay, it won't. This needs to be five and six, sorry. So it will average this area here if you compute this location. And if you take this location, you can also get one over four, and you get three plus four plus seven plus eight. So. If we do that, this is a single operation and this is a single operation. And this resides in the memory of the graphics card. So if we do our kernel evaluations, I just have to transfer, because this is done by the texture unit, I will also dramatically decrease the bus load because now I only have to transfer one floating point value here and one floating point value here. So also the data transfers are dramatically uh, reduced. If I computed this in my kernel, I would have four additions, and I would have to transfer all of this into my processing unit and then do the computation. But instead, using the texture unit, I'm only accessing here and here, 
I have a single sum. And of course, I only have to transfer two values over the bus instead of eight. So I have a speed up of four in terms of data transfers, and I also only have to do two additions instead of eight. So this is very, very useful if you do sums and stuff like that, or averaging. And of course, this will scale to 3D images. So in a 3D image with a 3D texture, you can compute the average over eight elements, over eight memory elements at the same time. So if you expand this uh, to, to trilinear filtering, you can very efficiently compute sums also over volumetric images. So this is very quick. This is very useful. So graphics cards are very useful in all kinds of image processing tasks. So if you try to build your integral images, you can do that with texture units and it will be very efficient because you have to integrate everything, right? This is the setup of such a GPU so and a CPU. On the left-hand side, you can see you typically have um, some processing units here. The, the, it has a cache, some control memory, and you have access to the RAM, to the main RAM of the computer. And on a GPU, you have plenty of arithmetic units, so plenty of units where you can do computations. And then you have a very small cache and a very small control memory. So here, are the, here is where the local variables are stored, and you have a very small cache here. And the drawback of this is there is there's no caching functionality. So if you have to go to the global memory, access to the global memory will be rather slow. So what you want to do is you want to reduce the transfers from the uh, random access memory to your arithmetic unit. And one way to do it is, for example, using texture units, because then you have less communication over the bus. So now the cool thing is, for example, with the bilateral filter, we can compute a single kernel in every thread. And another thing that is a big difference between graphics hardware and uh, a usual CPU is also the generation of new processes is extremely cheap. So if you decide to run a million processes on your CPU, there's a high overhead uh, associated with generating a new thread. So typically on a CPU, you would generate as many threads as you actually have computing units. And then you want to reuse the threads, but only access different data. On the GPU, generating a new thread is super cheap. So you can generate millions of threads. So what you do is you just create a thread for every pixel and then just put it onto your graphics cards and it will generate all those threads and do the, all the computations. So now what you do is you compute a single kernel here just in a single thread. So you're essentially skipping over the for loop. You usually would have a for loop over X and Y that accesses all the pixels. You get rid of the two outer for loops, but you only have one for loop that is computing the kernel and the kernel weighted with the image. And there you go, there you have your um, bilateral filtering. Okay, good. So typically you have a single floating point precision on the graphics cards, but nowadays uh, there is graphics boards available that also do double. And you can also have graphics boards that do half precision. That will be even faster. Good. Then one thing that you have to keep in mind is um, if you start parallelizing things, um, you may run into a, bit of uh, into a bit of trouble because depending on the sequence of your, if, if you parallelize the computation of a sum, then due to the floating point accuracy, you may get different floating point results because you can only store a precision um, of seven decimal digits. And if you, have, if you have some very small value and you add it to a very large value that might have been created by the addition sequence, then you may have the case that you want to add a very small value that doesn't change the large value anymore. But if you start adding a lot of small values first and then add it to the large value, then you get numerically different results just by the parallelization. So if you start computing stuff in parallel, don't 
uh, don't be too surprised if you suddenly get slightly different numerical results. This is a result of the parallelization and it's associated with the accuracy that you can do precisions. Good, so you, you can have rounding errors. And you should also be careful uh, that you may have overflow. Yeah? Okay. Good, in particular, one thing that might cause trouble is that this covariance is no longer is no longer correct. Good. Yeah, and here you can see, you can actually see an error analysis. And on the left hand side, you see an implementation using uh, integral images and mean filtering. And on the right hand side, you can see um, covari erroneous covariance using the separable mean filtering. Yeah? So, you can get um, a very different uh, number of errors if you start separating. Here is some computation results, and here you can see very nicely for, for VGA resolution, depending on the kind of graphics cards that you are using. So this is two different graphics cards, the FX2800 versus the GTX. Um, 285, and here we have the bilateral filter, the guided filter, and just the, what's R? This is just a normal convolution? No. Okay, so the round is, is R, and R is always very, very efficient. Okay, one thing that you can see very nicely is that you if implement the bilateral filter and you will see this, um, you will really see that the complexity is dependent on the kernel radius with R square. The other thing that you see is if you implement a guided filter, you truly have this complexity of one. So it always has the same effort independent of your kernel size. Excellent. And this also holds for different different graphics cards. Yeah? So you have the same, this is a faster graphics card, so it also computes the bilateral filter faster, but it also computes the guided filter uh, an order of magnitude. Well, this is of course a different complexity. Good, some take home messages. So pre-processing is a fundamental step. We can restore invalid values if we can identify them by, uh, for example, uh, detecting outliers, and we've talked about edge preserving denoising. And of course, one thing you can do is uh, algorithmic measures. So you can choose a good algorithm that you can implement very quickly to get a real time algorithm. And the other thing that you can do is you can use highly parallel hardware to do very quick processing. These are the main things you should take home, and here's a couple of further readings. Do we have questions so far? Question? No? So this guided filter is very nice because you have this uh, constant complexity, but of course the filter output is also, it's edge preserving, but it's different from your bilateral filter. You get something else. Good. In this case, if you, you don't have um, additional questions, then I would like to, do you have questions? No? Then I would like um, to show another application which is called the joint bilateral filtering. And this is used for denoising and material decomposition for photon counting detectors. And we will go fr shortly through a new technology that is photon counting detectors. So we use that in research. It's not yet used clinically, but it's a new kind of X-ray detector technology which allows you to separate between different bins, between different energies of the photons. And we will first talk a bit about detectors. So typically what your detector does, it just computes the integral over all incident energies. So you get the total energy that is received by the detector, by the specific pixel. So it will just compute the integral over this entire um, so you have many different energies that arrive at your detector, but it will only compute the integral over it. 
So just the integral. Then you can also go ahead and if, if, you, if you just have an energy integrating uh, detector, you have the number of photons times their energy and then you integrate um, over the entire spectrum. And of course you have to consider all the different things that the beam of photons has seen along its path and they get absorbed of course, but in the end they are entirely absorbed at the detector. So now if we have uh, a photon counting detector, let's say we have a detector with some logic that is able to measure each incident photon, then we can count the number of photons. And if we had a photon counting detector, it would count every photon equally. So it would be independent of the energy. So the result that we measure at the photon counting detector would be the probabilistic absorption through the object times the incident number of photons, the number of photons that we generated at the source, then they get attenuated and everything that uh, survives the object will be counted in this photon counting detector. And now we also have the case of a photon counting energy resolving detector and this photon counting energy resolving detector will only compute partial integrals. So it would only compute the integral over the first part of the spectrum, the center part, or the, or the third part. The first thing that we immediately realize is now we have essentially three bins at every pixel. So at every pixel we get three measurements instead of one. And if we sum those three measurements up, we get the same measurement that we could, would get only from a photon counting detector. The next thing that we realize is noise in x-ray images is dependent on the number of photons that arrive. And the more photons arrive in a detector cell, the better the signal to noise ratio is. So the more, the more photons, the less noise. Now if you look at this, we realize the number of photons hasn't changed. The total number of photons in this spectrum is still the same. So in bin one to bin three, we get in every bin, we get much less photons. This has two effects. First of all, it's a good thing if we have less photons because then it's more easy to count them. If we have few photons, then we don't have to have too high count rates. And the typical problem with these detectors is that they go into saturation. If you have too many photons arriving at a single pixel, you cannot count them anymore and it will just tell you max saturated cannot count this anymore. The other thing is, in every bin, we only have few photons now, much fewer than before. And in particular, the low energy bin, the most left one, has very few photons here. And few photons means that we have a lot of noise in this bin. Okay. So this is just a reminder that you can actually, the photons will be Poisson distributed. And if you do the math, you will realize that your signal divided over noise will be a function um, of k square, where k is the expected number of photons. So the higher the number of photons, the higher your signal to noise ratio will get. So what we can do now is we can simulate a couple of objects because, well, why do we simulate this? One reason is these detectors, in particular the large scale detectors, are not yet in clinical practice, so we simulate their behavior. We have a couple of new measurements now from a real photon counting detector, and you re realize that the large area flat panel detectors nowadays, they are, let's say, rather experimental. So the image quality that you get from them is not as good as you get from a traditional energy integrating detector, because these, this technology is still under development. So there's preclinical examinations, but there's no, um, no real clinical use of this technology yet. We can simulate that, and we realize that for simulating the noise and the absorption in the single pixel, all that we need is the path lengths of the X-ray beam through the specific tissues. So for a simulation, we can just generate an image that shows us the different materials in the image, and we can use the, only the material path length to simulate the respective images. And here's an example that we, that we used. We have 
myocardium, so this is the heart muscle. Then we have blood. And here we have the blood in the left ventricle. In case you want to virtually inject some contrast agent into the left ventricle, you can replace the blood with a blood that is, has a certain degree of contrast. And here we also have coronary arteries that you can see here. And those coronary arteries are in our case now filled with a contrast agent called Ultravist uh, 370. And this is an iodine-based contrast agent that is typically clinically used. And now if we have that, we can actually just use this data and evaluate a traditional polychromatic energy discriminating, uh, typical polychromatic energy in integrating detector. We can simulate a photon counting detector, or we could also simulate an energy resolving detector. And if we do that, we get different, different images. And one thing that you will realize, this is already line integral domain. So this is already the amount of absorption that you have on every specific ray. And you realize that the image on the left, do you actually see that? Yeah. You see that the image on the left is, even if it will spoil the video recording, we just shortly do this because then the audience here can see this much better. The image on the left has very high intensity values. And high intensity values in this respect mean that there is also high absorption, which means that there is also a lot of noise. And you can see that the image on the left really has a lot of noise. BIN 2 already has much higher energy photons, so they are less likely to be absorbed, which will give us less absorption of the ray. So we have, in total, lower intensities. But we have, at the same time, a much, uh, a much reduced noise level because much more photons actually are, are, are arriving at every uh, detector pixel. And the right-hand side image, we also have um, pretty low contrast values, pretty low absorption values, and also increased noise on the bin number three because there's also few photons in here. If you go back to the original spectrum, here you had the spectrum, you realize that in bin one and bin three there's fewer photons, and most of the photons go to bin two. So we can understand this in a physical sense, what is actually happening here. So now we can turn back on the light, and we can go back to our idea with the bilateral filter. Here we have the bilateral filter again, but this version of the bilateral filter is slightly different because we have introduced, so we have the S, which is the spatial closeness, and we have the I, the intensity kernel, but now we will compute the intensity kernel. Okay, so this is, uh, but we will use the intensity kernel and will not compute the similarity just in the input image, as we did in the bilateral filter, but instead, we will compute a guidance image. And in this case, the guidance image is simply the sum over all energy bins. Because if you compute the sum over all three energy bins, you get the most photons. And the most photons means the highest signal-to-noise ratio. So you use the energy bin, and you use the sum over all energy bins, and you create your guidance image with that. But then the actual denoising is only controlled by the guidance image, but you're not actually using intensities from this, int from this image, but you only take the input, input data from the bin, and only the formation of your kernel is controlled by the guidance image. So guidance image only controls the shape of the kernel, but the actual intensity values only stem from the original energy bin. And if you do that, you can actually start denoising the image. You can also do some contour-aware filtering, but um, uh, forget about that, that this is just to not filter over same amount of contrast agent, but just, just skip over this. But we have now, we can define different versions of this filtering approach, but all of them actually have an intensity sigma and they have a degree of smoothing, a spatial sigma. So this is all that I need to set. And I can actually measure the, those two values from the guidance image. So I take the guidance image, and then I select an edge that I want to preserve. I just draw a profile across it, and I measure the intensity difference. And from this intensity difference, I can derive 
the uh, a, amount of smoothing that I need to put into my intensity sigma. So I can, for example, say 50%, or I can t say 10%, depending on how accurately I want to preserve the edges. The other thing is I can also determine the degree of smoothing. For example, I can just use um, a Gaussian kernel and compute different versions with the Gaussian kernel, and then I pick the version that has exactly the amount of noise that I want to have for my application. So these are the two ways how I determine the intensity sigma and the spatial sigma, and then I can use my bilateral filter. And the results are pretty interesting. So this is the result with no noise, again, in line integral domain. So we already computed back into absorption. And here now you see a very interesting effect because if I now add noise, so let's say I take a typical uh, dose as I would have for a CT image. If I try to do CT, I take this kind of illumination. Now this, by the way, wh what are we imaging here? Can, can you guess what we are imaging? Ribs, what else? Spine, right? So we have the ribs, we have the spine on the left-hand side. This is the spine, these are the ribs. What is this stuff here? Yeah, that's the, the coronary artery, and they are filled with contrast agent. So the contrast agent is visible, and then in the very background you see the shape of the heart, and here you can see the diaphragm and the liver dome. So just that you that we're on the same ballpark with anatomy. So this is a, a chest X-ray focused on the heart, and it's actually taken from from this from a lateral direction because we can see the spine in the back. So now we can. Do you actually see that, or should I turn off the light again? I will turn. So you see the noise pretty well. Now what happens is this has been one, and in bin one we have pretty bad photon statistics. And do you see all the white stuff that is down here? Do you see all the white pixels here? What happened in those? So I have a very, very high degree of absorption here. Hmm? No, not overexposure, but uh, very close. Uh, this, is, this is line integral domain, so we, it's the minus log. And here, if you take the logarithm of zero and multiply it with uh, minus one, you, you have no photons arriving at this pixel. And if there's no photons arriving, it corresponds to an infinite, uh, an infinite absorption along this ray. So what we get here is photon starvation. So there's no photons arriving at those pixels, and therefore we cannot determine the path length because no photon arrived here. And now we can use our tricks and our uh, in this case, our joint bilateral filter immediately also includes a normalized convolution because we have zero observation where we have invalid observations. So we don't even have to consider the, that it's invalid because we are filtering actually in intensity domain. But what you can see very nicely is if I use this trick now, we can very nicely fill up those places where we didn't get valid observations. You see these were all invalid, and now if we uh, introduce our joint bilateral filtering, we get some observations here. One other thing that you can observe is we get a much better preservation of contrast edges and rib edges up here because there's fewer, there's fewer path lengths, so we have better photon statistics here, and in this part we have much more absorption. <laughs> and we have a much higher degree of smoothing. It's because we have only measured in intensity domain. And now I can use this trick of preserving the same amount of contrast agent, which I did not explain very well, I just jumped over it, but you can very nicely see if I use this trick. Look at the bottom left of the image, look at this part of the image. So you can see if I don't do that, I get a very smeared image but I can also preserve the edges in this part very nicely if I use this trick, uh, which actually involves computing. Uh, you, you have a locally adaptive uh, range sigma that is dependent on the degree of absorption along the way. But this works very nicely. Good. So you can also do this in image domain. So after reconstruction, you can do this trick again. And here you can see uh, reconstruction without noise of the heart. This is the reconstruction with noise. This is the reconstruction with only projection domain filtering. 
And this is the reconstruction with projection domain joint bilateral filtering and reconstruction domain joint bilateral filtering. And you can actually see that these are, this is blood, you see, and this is hard muscle and this is blood. And you can see it much better in this image here. And the difference in terms of, the difference in terms of density, so blood has approximately a density of 1.06 grams um, per cubic meter. And here, uh, sorry, grams per, per cubic centimeter. Yeah. So it's 1.06, so yeah, it's slightly denser than water. And the heart muscle has 1.05 uh, grams per cubic centimeter. And here you can see that this is only a slight uh, deviation in intensity, but we are almost able to reconstruct uh, this degree of intensity, by, uh, this change in, this difference in intensity by using projection domain and uh, reconstruction domain joint bilateral filtering. We can also do material decomposition and we, I'm jumping over, I'm not explaining how material decomposition actually works. If you want to know how material decomposition works, I can give you a couple of papers, but you can also use this and uh, do material decomposition using a neural network and a polynomial fit. So this is more or less the state of the art. And I hope you can see, first of all, the left-hand side is much more noisier and the right-hand side uh, gives you a better separation and also the noise reduction. And here we have the joint bilateral filtering plus a neural network for the material decomposition. This might look quite nice, but actually the result is much more astonishing if you look at the bone channel. So you can also reconstruct the bone intensities along every ray. And you can see here that our polynomial fit the, uh, has a much, a lot of correlated signal of the iodine contrast. It also po pops up in the bone image. And if you're using a multilayer and perceptron and neural network, you, and the denoising approach we just seen, you can get a much better separation between bone and contrast agent. So this is actually pretty useful. And the material decomposition works much better if you do appropriate denoising before that. Remember what we're doing is nonlinear. So this is also affecting our polynomial fit a bit. So the polynomial fit is actually better without the denoising. You get trouble into decomposition of the nonlinear processed images. This is why we're using a neural network on the right hand side for the material decomposition because it uh, deals with the nonlinearity much better. So this is all what I wanted to show you about uh, photon counting energy resolving detectors. And you've seen that this is a very different application than range imaging. But still we can use the same tricks that we used to to improve range images, we can use very similar tricks here for our photon counting energy resolving detectors. So this is also one of the things that you should realize in this class, how you can take the building blocks and combine the algorithms and then put it uh, to something useful in a new application. So you will probably, if somebody employs you in industry, they won't be too happy if you can't just implement things that you've seen in papers or if you can just implement things by the book. But instead, what they want to see is that you're able to creatively com uh, combine different methods and tailor them to your specific problem. So this is a thing that they're very eager to see in industry. And of course, this is also something that is very useful if you're working in research. Good. So there's a couple of papers that you can read. Um, if you're interested in this topic more, but you can also ask us because we have a, a, running, research prob uh, a running research project with this topic. If you want to see how bad the real data really is, you can also ask me. I'm not showing this here. <laughs> Do you have any questions? One thing that you can also take from this lecture, things are always nice if you do them in simulation. So in simulations, you can essentially show that your algorithm works theoretically on this problem. But as soon as you go to real data, you will realize that real data is much more difficult 
and oftentimes you will have to change your algorithm a lot if you only developed it on simulation data because the real data typically is much more challenging. This is also something you should definitely take home. If somebody shows you something in a simulation and it works, it's all fine, but that's only a proof of concept. If it really works on real data, then it's a robust, good algorithm. And this is oftentimes much more difficult. Okay, so if you, if you don't, any questions? The big question mark? Then towards the end of the video, I'll turn the, the light on again, that you can see me at full light. But other than that, yes, there's a question. Excuse me, can you repeat? A tutorial how to produce those algorithms. Yeah, I can actually, so the algorithms I showed in here, yeah. you can actually uh, download them. Um, I can give you a link to GitHub where you can actually download the implementation. Yeah, just send me a, a note and I will, I will send you a link where you can find the algorithm for download. Any more questions? Oh, and you can, of course, also do the simulations uh, with some open source framework that we are providing. No. Any more questions? No more questions. Then see you next week. Thank you.